in, you can hit, oh, better. perfect. So today we are working on the first ever radically rural white paper, uh, which we do plan to send to Congress and the press at the end of the year when it's finished. Uh, so what is a white paper? How many of you all have written or collaborated on a white paper before? Great. Perfect. So for those of you who may not know, um, the purpose of a white paper is to give the reader, so in this case it would be Congress, an understanding of an issue or many issues, which helps them to solve a problem. And typically it advocates for a certain position. Most of the things uh, that we're gonna be talking about in this particular white paper are not necessarily new concepts. You know, a lot of the opportunities and barriers in rural communities are consistent around uh, across the board, not all, but some. However, it really does matter to put weight behind something. So because we have hundreds of rural practitioners in our network, if we can have a lot of voices giving weight to an issue or many issues, it really does matter. That's why when you're doing policy advocacy, they say, call your senators, you know, call your representatives, because the more they hear about something, the more likely they are to pay attention and take action. When I was talking with Tony Pippa from Brookings Institution who helped conduct the focus groups during the Radically Rural Summit that led to the kind of initial framing of the white paper. I said, you know, I really, whether we're bringing something light to light that's new or not, would really love to put, make this count for something. And he said, it definitely counts for something because even if the context is not new, the process of engaging and being informed by leaders and practitioners from your network provides invaluable credibility and experience, and it gives us a basis for direct engagement with congressional delegation and agency officials that's authentic and direct. So rather than you know pushing something that already exists, it gives us our own kind of starting place to engage with um, the congressional delegation. So we're really excited to do this. This is a very collaborative process, as you can tell, given the fact that I sent out an editable document for everyone to participate in. So if you find that you're saying, hmm, we're really missing some context in the introduction about X, Y, or Z, put it in there. Just directly put it in there. I saved an original copy. You don't need to worry about that. Um, just you know, if you have a concept or an idea or a solution or a barrier, please put it in there and then add your name to the end so that we can give credit for everyone who has collaborated on this. All right. So enough um, of that. What I'd like to do since we we only have like um, how many people on the call? 12 or so. Um so I'd like to just go around and quickly introduce ourselves, and then I'm going to let Steve Fortier give us a little bit of an overview on some recent announcement, announcements that the Biden administration has made about rural um, benefits that they've come out with. And so I'd like to give him some time to talk about that so that we can have that backdrop in mind, and then we'll get to work. All right, so I will just start um, in order my screen and then everybody can tag the next person. Uh, so Lillian, go ahead and introduce yourself first and introduce who you are, your organization and the state you're joining from. Hi, I'm Lillian. I am in New Hampshire at the Hannah Grimes Center. So I also work for Radically Rural and I will tag Maddie. Thank you. My name is Maddie Layton. I am also in New Hampshire. I have two jobs that are um, related to one another. First of all, I work for Grafton Regional Development Corporation. I manage the Enterprise Center at Plymouth, which is a business incubator. And I'm also the executive director of the Central New Hampshire Chamber of Commerce. And I tag uh, Katie Bergen. Thank you. My name is Katie Bergen. I'm one of the recruitment managers at the American Connection Corps program, um, which is essentially a rural prosperity service year program um, that serves the entire nation. Um, and I'm calling from North Carolina. And 
I will pass it over to Taylor Stucker. Hey everyone, Taylor Stucker. Uh, I'm the executive director of the American Connection Corps. I work with Katie uh, on that program. Uh, I normally would be calling you from uh, Wilmington, Ohio, but I'm actually calling in from Washington, D.C. this week. So um, I will pass it on to Lisa Rotbold. Hi, I'm Lisa Rotbold. I work with the Red River Community Housing Development Organization in the Northeast, operating in the Northeast corner of North Dakota. Um, I found you guys about a year ago, and I've kind of been lurking in the background, and i um, happy to be here. Um, I tag Christina. Lurking is such a great word. Thank you for saying that. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christina Mortel. I'm the Small Business Advisor at the Texas Women's University Center for Women Entrepreneurs. Uh, I'm also uh, in economic development, and I've been following you as well. Um, one thing I wanted to say is that this past year, we did a we had a grant opportunity for 35 um, rural owned businesses. And so we're really trying to focus our efforts on rural economic development. That's one reason why I'm here. I put my contact information in the chat um, and we're really trying to look holistically at this problem. And I know I'm way down here in Texas, but there are so many similarities and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for sending the uh, advance of the white paper. I'd like to work on it too. And I will tag Dawn. Thank you. Dawn, you're muted. Hi, I'm Dawn Mant. I'm the executive director of the Red River Regional Council. We're a four county economic development district in Northeast North Dakota. And Lisa and I work together. Um, really curious about all these things. I've been following the Aspen Institute's work for the last couple of years. It's very fascinating to me, and it feels like it's moving the needle on the federal side, and I'm really curious how to move the needle on the state side. <laughs> so, um, Erica. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Erica Canales with Coas Economic Development Corporation. I am in the northernmost largest county in New Hampshire and most rural. And uh, my prior life, I was a policy wonk. Now I'm in, in running uh, economic development. So it's nice to get back into the side of things. And I got on late, so I'm not sure who has gone yet or not. Steve, did you already go? No, thank you, Erica. Good to see you. Um, Steve Fortier. I um, live in Alstead, New Hampshire, and I work for the state of New Hampshire as the administrator of rural economic development. Uh, John. Hey there, everybody. My name is John Ignatowski. I am the grants advocate and coordinator at the Adirondack North Country Association, other known as ANCA. We're based out of Saranac Lake, but we serve the 14 most uh, northernmost counties in upstate New York. So we have a pretty big geography. We are an economic development organization focusing on building a new economy in this region. Um, and I'm going to call out Zach, my coworker. Thanks, John. Hi, folks. Zach Hobbs, also from ANCA. Um, apologies, my camera also doesn't work. I also am going to disappear at 2.50, so thanks for your patience on both of those things. My first interaction with this uh, with this initiative, standing in for my colleague, Danny Delaney, who is uh, who attended the summit, has been very stoked and spoken very highly about all this work, so I'm, I'm excited to be here and be a part of it. Um, Eileen. Hi, my name is Eileen Sarson, and I've been a volunteer with Radically Rural from the beginning. I'm based here in Keene, New Hampshire, and I just think everything about it sort of pulls me in, um, especially the economic development. I spent a little bit of time working with the New Hampshire Small Business Development Centers, so new startups really excite me. And Eileen, I don't think Leo's gone yet, so you could pass to oh, him. Yeah. Here we go. Hey, everybody. I got the camera working. Um, Leo York here. I'm with the Inventors Network Kentucky. We're one of the ESO partners with uh, Anna Grimes uh, as part of their GAFC program. And uh, yeah, I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. So glad to meet everyone. All right, and I think we've got Chris left. 
I'm uh, Chris Campen, I'm executive director of the Wyndham Regional Commission. We serve 27 towns in southeast Vermont. We're based in Brattleboro. Uh, and in a former life, I was the federal policy coordinator for the National Campaign for Sustainable Agriculture on the 2002 Farm Bill. My, my job for four years was building coalitions around the Farm Bill. So this is fun. I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> Wonderful. Did anyone not get to go? What a great group. Okay. Um, so Steve, I'm going to give you a few minutes just to kind of brief us on some recent annou announcements and anything we should consider as we uh, work on this together today. Sure. Thanks, Juliana. Um, yeah, I think the main thing is what you already said. Um, be in touch with your local legislators, your local federal delegation members. I think uh, what I'm about to report will stress the importance of that. Um, first of all, I'm delighted that um, there's so many on the call who were not part of the two focus groups uh, that Tony led during Radically Rural. So that means we'll get a lot of new input and information that'll make the white paper even more valuable. So thank you for being here. Um, quick report out on the recently announced um, investing in rural America. Uh, the, the Biden administration touted $5 billion going out to rural communities through a variety of different programs to rural uh, communities in America uh, through a variety of programs. Um, in I attended, he, he sent admin, or cabinet members out and about throughout the country to highlight some things. Actually, while we speak, uh, someone high up in the USDA rural development is in Lower Bartlett, New Hampshire, touting an investment in a water project there. Um, two Fridays ago, I went to, Red, uh, to River Valley Community College where Sec uh, U.S. Education Secretary Cardonis was there to talk about education, and I learned a bit more about what's going on uh, in other areas as well. My main takeaway in doing the research for this conversation is that much of the uh, five billion that is being promoted is actually already out the door. It was in the form of earmarks. Um, so again, back to Juliana's uh, point earlier. Um, being in touch with our federal delegation members and ongoing basis is really important because the decisions in this case in five billion worth of investments in rural America were made over the past 18 months and are just now being sort of bundled under this this new heading of investing in rural America. But the funding is in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the um, um, uh, I apologize. I'm in the midst of COVID, so I've got a bit of a fog brain right now, but the um, in, uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act money and other federal uh, funds that have been uh, already announced are embedded in this billion that they're touting now. Um, <clears throat> I will put in, because people are from around the country, um, uh, I just put in the chat where you can see the major buckets of funding that were um, put under this umbrella. And then it has four links to four different program areas where you can see uh, the funding that went to your state in each of those four uh, categories. Uh, in New Hampshire, for those of us that are from here, uh, there were a few different in the, um, the REAP, the Rural Energy for America program. Uh, 15 different projects in New Hampshire were uh, received funding through that. And as I mentioned earlier, one uh, project through the rural jobs and infrastructure funding um, that you'll see in the link that I provided there. So um, not much new to report other than, again, to stress the fact that these relationships with our federal delegation members are really important because they're uh, they're looking out for and advocating on behalf of our uh, projects and our initiatives in our regions, uh, but they need to know about what we're up to before or what we're envisioning uh, in order to embed that into funding opportunities that are coming across their desk. So within the five billion, very little in competitive funding. You'll see a little bit um, 
within the Rural Partners Network. Uh, I encourage you to pull that link up. In fact, I'll I'll, I'll embed that as a separate uh, link when I'm done uh, talking here. But um, I found that the uh, the Rural uh, Partners Network part of the website um, to be incredibly valuable. I've bookmarked that for the future because that's where we can see ongoing funding opportunities uh, for those of us uh, serving and working with and li living in rural communities in America. So I'll put that in as well. Happy to entertain any questions. And um, if I do disappear at some point in the 90 minutes, I apologize, but I'm feeling the need for some rest. <laughs> so hope that made no. some sense. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Steve. And yes, you should absolutely rest always. <laughs> um, so that's really, really helpful. Thank you for that context. And, you know, if you think about it, all of us are living, working, recreating, either one or all of those things in rural communities. And so we have unique perspectives to add to this conversation. So the way that we're going to be doing this is it's definitely a collaborative interactive um, process where you have a jam board and I'm going to let Lillian give us a little overview of the jam board and how to use it. If you're unable to use it, you can always drop your answers in the chat and we can put them on the jam board for you. Um, so I'll let her give a brief introduction and we're gonna basically just be using it to go over the three questions we sent out ahead of time. Um, the first question we will introduce without referencing the draft of the white paper, and then the other two questions we will reference the draft of the white paper for. So I'll let Lillian go ahead with that. So I went ahead and threw the link in the chat. I can see a few of you popping on, and let me just share my screen here so I can show you how to use it. So can everybody see that on my screen? Okay. So we're gonna answer the first question, like Juliana said, without looking at the white paper. And the way that you do that is if you see this little panel over here and you click on a sticky note, you can type whatever you want in there, your answer to the question, your ideas about the question, hit save, and then your sticky note will pop up and you can move it around the board wherever you would like. So we'll give a so few minutes. Lillian, everybody... Yes. My access is view only. Okay. I clicked on the link. Let me. It says I can request edit access. All right. I just updated it, so it should be good now. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Great. So we'll give a few minutes for people to put their thoughts and answers to the question up there. So I'll just read the question out loud, which is, if you had the opportunity to say one thing to Congress about either your specific rural community or rural communities in general, or both, I'll throw that in there what would it be? And we'll give you guys say about three minutes to, to put your answers in there. Could I be provided access also? I'll also need access. Thank you. If you go ahead and refresh the page, it should up, okay. be updated. Uh, thank you. Let us know if you still have issues after refreshing. And Lily, what we could do probably is um, stop sharing until everyone's done and then we'll share again. That might make it easier. And if you're having issues and you'd rather drop your answers in the chat, feel free. So did you just do something because I was editing my sticky note and it dis it refreshed and my note disappeared? Hmm. No, yeah, it should be working, but I was type in there. Yeah, I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> Why don't we just switch over to the chat? That seems like a better option right now. What do you think, Juliana? <laughs> sure. We try to be, you know, fancy and <laughs> I 
We have like two more minutes. All right, could everyone just put a, a thumbs up on their little screen if they're ready to go? Okay. Got a lot of great answers coming through here. All right, Lillian, um, do you want to share? screen again and we can start to go over some of these. And Lillian, were you able to snag everything from the chat? Yes. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. So in no particular order, um, why don't we have folks that feel really strongly about the statements that they made just pop in and read them? And then we'll kind of scoot the ones we've already read maybe over to one side, Lillian, so that we know which ones have been read. All right, so I'll start. Now I'll break the ice here. Um, so I said the time it takes to apply for, manage, report on, and stay in compliance with federal grants is excessive. Most small communities and organizations cannot sustain that. Thus, the week that Lillian and I have had <laughs> with the um, hundreds of pages of deliverables and reports we've putting we've been putting together for one federal grant that we manage. Um, and it looks like we've got someone that agrees with that statement. So next person, just hop in. That would I'm be gonna... Maddie agreeing with that statement, by the way. Oh, yeah. I'm going to hop in and piggyback on that, mm -hmm. if that's OK. Yes, um, please. My name is real economies are not the same as urban as in urban places. Federal regulations designed to work in urban settings do not translate well in small rural places. Um, for me, absolutely, one hundred percent. What you said, I'm going to add on um, because I do construction. Um, mm -hmm. Davis Bacon and Section Three um, are really problematic and can lead to zero bidders. <laughs> mm. <laughs> They're really prohibitive. Um, mm. So, and and they and also they don't make sense. They're not doing what they're intended to do in a small market. It just it's just absolutely different scenario. Okay, that's really great because of how specific it is. So if you could at some point, um, it doesn't have to be today, but at some point, if you could type up a little bit more about that and how it's manifesting itself in your particular work um, and then add it either to the white paper or email it to us directly, that would be great because I think that's a, a really good specific example that we'd like to include. My example on, on Lisa's comment is I have oh, almost $2.5 million secured and we've let bids twice on a 10,000 square foot incubator that's a renovation on our main street. The first bid came in a million three over and I didn't get 
any construction bids last week when we attempted a second time. Oh my goodness. Um, I added one, uh, need to do nationwide assessment of rural community capacity to access federal programs. I think maybe what we could actually do, including the white paper, is actually as part of the Farm Bill, direct the General General Accountability Office, or Government Accountability Office. I still know it is the General Accounting Office um, to actually do an assessment to determine the extent to which the, the communities that these programs are intended for actually in real real world have the capacity to actually access these these programs and manage them. Um, mm -hmm. And so anyway, just. And from what I gather, this, this, the Biden administration is, I've, I've had a number of different people tell me that the Biden administration is actually realizing this and they're trying to figure out how to make their pro program access better. So mm -hmm. maybe the timing is right on that. I'm not sure. Okay, great. Thank you. That's super helpful. Uh, this is Erica. So I had put in there planning compa and capacity grants are needed for us to kind of use as a building block. And that the heavy lifting, like the other folks were saying, for filling out these funding opportunities needs to be lightened. So if we can add maybe to the example that CDBG is another great fund, or, you know, pot, but it's just, mm. it's such a heavy burden to lift that, you know, we tend to shy away from that kind of with the Davis-Bacon. Mm -hmm. And I was also going to add one more um, in the chat as well, that um, if we can have EDA and HUD money work better together for our rural main streets since we have so much mixed use housing that would actually help mm. us meet those needs and I have lots of examples of that. Yes, please please type up some of those examples. That's that's excellent. <clears throat> because I think like you know, and Steve made this point when he and I were kind of preparing for this session that the best legislators and advocates oftentimes pair what they're recommending with stories. And so I think if we can have some stories that support what we're saying, it's likely to connect better. So feel free to type those up, put them directly in the white paper or email them to us. Thank you. I ex on my same example with this incubator, I explored CDBG and I was told we'd likely have to do a phase two environmental review for $25,000 and 3000 foot radius of this building. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Next. Oh, I mentioned, um, well, I read rural communities need focus and funding to grow economies. Uh, and keep families and businesses in the area while drawing in. Um, but because there's a lack of health care and uh, child care, and I can't see my other your infrastructure, um, this is really a challenge. And I, my insight into this is because we have real issues in um, Texas with child care deserts. And I've been working specifically with one of the small businesses in order to show that child care grows economic development in rural areas if both parents can work and not to mention the extreme long distances they have to travel just to go to work. So I'm really trying to advance the idea that childcare uh, helps grow economic development. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just using this childcare uh, desert example as one. I mean, this is an issue for us in Texas among many other things, plus the shutting down of hospitals. But I don't know if there's an opportunity to write on that aspect, I would welcome that opportunity, but happy to answer any questions, uh, et cetera, on that as well. And then, yes, definitely. Christina, mm -hmm. we were working with a nonprofit out of Minneapolis who said there's, their analysis was that child care facilities under 100 slots were not economically feasible. So that's most rural child care centers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so scale is a real issue on a lot of these topics. We have 34 counties in North Dakota with food deserts out of 53 mm -hmm. in an agricultural oh state. So wow. just hard to keep restaurants open or or, or grocery stores with fresh food um, because of scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got, you know, the, we have a lot of like entrepreneurial solutions popping up around here around the childcare topic. And it is very challenging when, for example, home-based childcare is, 
can be a, a responsive entrepreneurial solution, but getting insurance to cover home-based childcare can be really, really challenging. So there's, there's definitely like structural barriers for that. Um, and so if you can think of things that the government could do, um, both with funding, you know, direct yeah. investment and outside of that too, um, please feel free to type it up and add it because that is a huge need and opportunity. Okay. Yeah, I'll definitely uh, address that uh, as well. And I know that we were waiting on the $16 billion that just got released from the federal, but I don't know how much of that is going to be earmarked for child care. As you know, right. the, all that child care expansion act uh, ended September 30th. So mm -hmm. I just want to get uh, clarity on that. And then I would be happy to add those comments or send them to you. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Who's next? <clears throat> All right. So Lillian, do you want to read out some of the ones we haven't read yet? Sure. So we have, there's a large gap between average household income and median house prices. We need better zoning laws to support affordable housing options. Um, federal housing funding is not useful as small towns are currently struck in small towns as currently structured. Um, finding more effective ways to invest at the local level, match requirements, which is a big one that we talk about, um, favor more metropolitan counties and municipalities or wealthy rural areas. And there's a great deal of cultural and economic potential that could be catalyzed by the proper resources, um, communities in and municipalities in Northern New England rely upon regional planning commissions to develop project scopes and applications, but we are generally not funded to do this. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, these are great. And if you'd like to add anything, even after our conversation, feel free, we'll check up on this again. Um, and if there's anything you'd like to say, it sounds like we've kind of hit some of the things that we'd like to say most about some of the barriers. If there's anything that you'd like to say about your rural community in general that Congress should know, like I think, Don, what you mentioned about scale and the number of counties in your area that are in food deserts in an agricultural state, you know, that's that's something that is just would be an example of something, or if there's something you really love about your rural community, feel free to put any of that up there. Um, so we'll now move on to question two. And this, it seems is gonna maybe be some overlap with the one we just did. So don't feel like you have to duplicate if you've already said something, but question number two is, um, do you have any barriers or opportunities you'd like to add to the existing white paper? So I'd like to reiterate, and we will put the link to the white paper in the chat, which is open and able to be edited by anyone. Um, I'd like to just remind everyone that the content of this was originally developed by focus groups that happened during the summit in September. And interviews that Keene High School students did with attendees during the summit. So it is certainly not comprehensive by any means. It's just what happened to bubble up during that time. And so feel free to add to this. Um, so if it's something that you've already put in question one, we will pull that and add it. So don't, don't feel like you need to duplicate. But what we'll do is we'll drop the link to the white paper in the chat and you can just take a few minutes read through what we've listed for um, problems and barriers, and then presentation of solutions and opportunities. I want to give an example of a solution that I found particularly interesting. So we've heard a lot about funding and how, um, you know, funding is like, it's wonderful, but it can also be a real burden as well, as far as the managing of the funding. And I don't know who from the focus group, but someone from the focus group said universal applications across funding sources. And I thought that was a like, just 
brilliant idea and one that is really practical. And so, you know, don't shy away from really innovative, practical solutions to some of these problems too, because it may just be, you know, like, oh, we never thought of that before. Maybe that could help. Um, so I'll just give everyone about five minutes to kind of read through what's already there in both barriers and solutions. And then as you go through and you'd like to add something, either add it directly to the document or um, put a sticky note in the Jamboard. So about 2.45, we'll start to sticky note, but feel free to do that along the way too.
All right. If you could raise your hand, either your real hand or your Zoom hand, if you need more time, that would be great. Okay. So in no particular order, uh, why don't folks, because I saw some people using Jamboard, some people putting it directly in the paper, either one is great. Why don't folks jump in with some of the things that they added? Thank you, Steve. Feel better. <laughs> I'll go ahead. So one of the barriers that I see as an economic development corporation in a rural, very rural area is that when we need to fund uh, riskier type startup loans in these small mom and pop communities, USDA's loan guarantee program requires that we have to be able to be doing a million dollars a year in lending, which as a rural community, we know that that's not realistic. And if they have their RMAP, their rural micro assistance programs max at 50K, I mean, it just, the numbers don't add up together. And that's mm -hmm. a barrier for the, us to be able to back these entities when we know they don't have the collateral or equity to help them get their businesses started. Wow. That's great. Thank you. Who else added something? Jump in. Um, so one of the, the notes that I made was around um, an opportunity to emphasize the support of place-based education initiatives more. Um, I came from a program that did this, and it's rated one of the, the best high schools in the state. Um, and I think a lot of that like, comes from their place-based approach. Um, so I'd love to see more, more of those opportunities in rural communities. Great. That's wonderful. Thank you. I added um, broken real estate markets in places that have not had development for many, many years. Mm -hmm. um, in our four county area, we, we've averaged like two building permits per year for the past 10 years. Um, there just hasn't, and that's average. One of them is way worse than the rest. So they're kind of bringing the average down. Um, mm -hmm. But with that little activity, the only homes that are being built are, you know, very high-end homes, people are paying cash for them. They don't need to finance them. But when you want to try and build, um, you know, a entry-level home or workforce housing, um, there are no comps for against mm. new, the cost of new construction. And it's not necessarily that people can't afford the payment on the house, but getting the financing. So we're trying to get over that hump and and actually be the developer and, um, and, you know, build houses every year so that we're building our own comps, but wow. it's, it's a weird issue. And I don't yeah. think people really are aware of that sometimes. Same thing on the rental side of things. I was talking to, um, a mayor the other day and he said <laughs> that they really need rental housing. Um, and I said, well, what do you have in town? He said, well, those duplexes we have are always full. I said, what are they charging rent? He said four hundred fifty dollars a month. <laughs> I was oh like, no wonder they're full all the time. You have to have higher rents. And yeah. I mean, I'm a nonprofit and I work to do affordable housing. But the fact yeah. of the matter is, we have to work in the world of reality. Things cost what they cost, and if your local market isn't keeping up, you're shooting yourself in the foot. And mm -hmm. so, um, some of that's wow. happening too. It reminds me a little bit, and I know this isn't the exact same thing, but have you heard of Lakota Vogel? She uh, works with, um, she's in, is it South Butte, Lily? Yeah, uh, I think so. And they had issues because the bank system that they were working with didn't build credit for some reason. And so they were having to start from scratch with like building folks credit or something like that. I'm trying to remember her story, but it sounds like a similar place of like having to build something from nothing that is normally just something that kind of like happens all along. And I know that they use some really innovative approaches for that. So um, we can send you the link uh, to her profile. She might have some interesting ideas. Oh, there you go, Lily. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. 
Okay, who else added something? Go ahead, Don. I'm I'm bringing this up because I I seem to like keep spinning on it and I haven't really figured out what the approach ought to be. But in our area, um, Grand Forks, North Dakota is our kind of urban center. And just yesterday they passed another sales tax extension. Well, the rural areas around Grand Forks are contributing more than half of that sales tax revenue, which is $25 million a year. And there's no sense of reciprocity. So we keep throwing our money to the cities and not really getting anything back. And they're already like extremely politically savvy. This same city brought home a hundred million dollars from the legislative body this year. Mm. And, and so it's like, we are very, you know, I, I don't know that there's great awareness of all of these mm. dynamics. Yeah. Like CVB in Grand Forks has a million dollar budget and six staff. And I'm trying to put together a four county tourism budget with three pennies and a nickel. Right. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And so there's no equity. I liked, yeah. honestly, the first time I read Aspen's description of this as being place-based discrimination, some of these things. At first I took offense to that almost, but it, it's accurate, right? Mm. Systems are really discriminatory towards wow. places. Wow. That's really the important. The other one is just in our rural area, we have 35,000 people, but they're spread amongst 41 communities. And so there's no mechanism to really do the heavy lifting with mm -hmm. that. But if you compare that to a city of a similar size, the resources, the multiple agencies and how they're all funded, there's so much more professional capacity to drive mm -hmm. things. Um, yeah. I, there's a lot of inequity um, that way. Yeah. Yeah, capacity is certainly a huge issue and also regional approach to economic development. You know, that's something it's very, that- very, very difficult work to try to yes. get 41. Mm -hmm. I'm, we're rolling out a, a visitor um, or a tourism plan to 41 communities simultaneously <laughs> next year. I mean, just oh think about that. Like yeah. <laughs> in, in a city, you have to get the city council aligned, you know, not 41 city councils. Right. <laughs> oh my goodness. So the dynamics of that are much more challenging. Yeah. Yeah. We had someone in rural um, Newfoundland, maybe who reached out to us and was just saying, you know, there, they don't have County seats and they have most of their towns are like less than a thousand That's people. Us. And they're kind yeah. of like, on their own and right. and he's just like how do we build regional capacity how do we build this like density and streamline what's going on and he felt like radically rural was kind of a good example of generating energy and building density and things like that and so that was the kind of the starting point of the conversation but um yeah please keep writing about that and thinking about that. And I'm sure that there are lots of other folks that are running into similar issues that would really either have something to contribute or also learn from what you're learning too. Um, so it, does anyone wanna add anything to this section before we go on to the next section? The next section is one, is the section that I personally feel like I need the most help on. Um, okay, so we'll move on. What what I'm struggling with is that there is no shortage of opportunities in rural communities, and there's also no shortage of barriers either in rural communities. And, you know, we have seven tracks that we focus on, plus, you know, housing, child care, you know, any rural education, any sort of topic that really is relevant to rural communities. And so I don't want it to be too wide or too nebulous. I want it to really hit home. And so the next section is about taking what's here and what may be added, um, a lot of the things that we've talked about, and really trying to boil it down to, say, three or four main themes that we're focusing on. And so um, I'm going to give folks about five minutes, since you've already probably at least skimmed it, 
what themes based on what's there that resulted from the summit, from our conversations that we've had today, what themes are you seeing pop up? And if you could either put them in the chat or on the Jamboard, that would be great. And then we'll sort of group those together and see what emerges. So um, at about three, say 302, we will come back together and start grouping those themes together. And it does not have to be worded in the way that it is on the white paper. So for example, capacity is kind of one main line item here. You don't have to word it that way, just whatever comes to rises to the top for you. Juliana, I'm sorry. When you did that first introduction, you got all of you froze for like 10 or 15 seconds. So I didn't hear everything you just said. So can you about, I, I'm so sorry. No worries at all. Oh my goodness. We have all either had the freeze or seen the freeze. So we get it. Um, I was just saying, since everyone's already probably at least skimmed the white paper, just give it another skim. Think about what themes rise to the top for you. And okay. we're looking for three to four themes. They don't have to be worded how they are in the white paper. Now they could be completely different, but just if we're really trying to, to send a few things home clearly, what is rising to the top and then either put it in the chat or on the jam board. And then at like 302 ish, we will start grouping those and seeing what, what comes to the top for everyone. I appreciate it. Thank you.
Okay. Who needs more time? All right, so someone make your case for what you think is one of the themes that rises to the top for this paper. What should we focus on? I put in there something to the effect of uh, more tailored solutions. You know, I, I think funding opportunities, I mean, everything I keep hearing is that every community's you know, we need to recognize the diversity in rural America. We need to recognize that community needs are different from place to place. Community capacity is different from place to place. So how do we find more innovative ways to provide, you know, tailored solutions rather than one size fits all policies or opportunities? I put in parentheses example CDBG 2.0 because I do feel like the CDBG a structure and framework was kind of innovative for its time. It was funding that went to states that was allowed for a variety of categories of uses, uh, but definitely needs a refresh uh, given some of the regulatory hurdles that are tied to it. Some of the, the, I feel like money kind of falls off of it as it makes its way from the federal government down to the local level. Um, and it's not up to date with a lot of community needs uh, and realities. For instance, we, I, in my area in Southern Ohio, CDBG funds often go towards park infrastructure in communities where there's no parks department or anyone to really maintain that infrastructure. And within years, this playground is falling apart and rusted and, you know, grass is growing up. So, you know, how do we, how do we find more ways to be tailored and, and provide needed capacity to access those funds or make the funds more accessible? That's great. Thank you. So probably a good way to categorize that would be tailored solutions, you think? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Think about too, like as we hear from other folks, be thinking what that might look like. Cause I completely agree with that. And I'm so curious, like how that could work. I kind of capped it in really broad categories because I think a lot of the things that we're talking about can fall under mm -hmm. you know, some of these broader categories. So yep. um, regulatory capacity, funding, and call it lifestyle, call it health and, you know, well-being, um, the, you know, access to healthy food and um, mm. recreation and well, health care. Um, regulatory, my, <laughs> my idea about regulatory, and I'm going to go back to the example that I gave earlier um, with the Section 3 and the Davis-Bacon, um, I get why, <laughs> you know, all those regs are in there for a reason, right? They're in there mm -hmm. because, you know, people will do what they can get away with, right? <laughs> yeah, right. And, um, and that happens everywhere. But um, in, in our case, I would make the argument that, um, you know, we're working in a community of uh, 4,000 people um, we have an unemployment rate of less than 2%. Um, everybody's getting paid the Davis-Bacon wages because we have a shortage of labor. Um, it's really an exercise in paperwork and it's a very cumbersome, time-consuming and very expensive exercise in paperwork that doesn't really accomplish anything. It doesn't add any value whatsoever to the use of these federal dollars. Um, and so having a, a waiver or a standard that says in circumstances where, you know, X, Y, Z, the population's under 50,000, or, um, you know, you have an unemployment rate, because I don't know what you guys know, but do you know about section three? It's really, it's mm. really cumbersome. <laughs> and it just does not work. We don't yeah. have any section three workers in North Dakota. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that really works. That I mean, is so if, important. Yep. if they were looking for a job, we'd put them to work. So um, yeah. it it's just, it feels like such a waste of time and such a burden and a waste of money. And it's, it, contractors don't have to deal with all that crap. They can just go do other work. There's plenty of work. Um, so yeah, my idea and kind of tailored solutions 
kind of falls in with that, but maybe having modified regulations. And, and I've been saying for years, and Don's heard me say it a thousand times, um, the rules need to be different for rural. <laughs> they just need to be different. <laughs> it's just not the same. It's true. And, you know, we even, we had a convening about rural philanthropy the night before the summit this year. And we even talked about, you know, with philanthropists and funders, it's oftentimes the case that they're looking for numbers. And so they might choose to fund an initiative or an area in an urban area because they get a higher body count. And that sounds bad. I mean, they're like looking for impact, which is a good thing, but in rural, the impact might not have the same number of bodies, but exponentially, sometimes a, like a small investment, you can make a really huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a little bit like that, where it's like, it's not the same, um, but it still matters and it's still important. Dawn? I have a couple things. I, I, had, I had written philanthropy down because I don't really see it on here, but I had a lengthy call just this morning with a, a friend and colleague who's the expert in philanthropy. And we kind of view ourselves as a great one-two punch. She's the expert in philanthropy and I'm the expert in government funding. Um, yeah. <laughs> but really, again, like building capacity around philanthropy, that's its own skill set also. Mm. Um, and in rural communities, often philanthropy is tied to healthcare or the church mm. and not much mm. else. Um, the other one I don't see on the list here anywhere, I'm curious about other areas of the country, but our area of the country here has been heavily impacted with immigrant labor. And so mm. the H-2A visa workers on the farms, we had in our, our four county region, 720 H-2A visa workers this, this year, which has also exacerbated the housing issues because farmers are required to provide them housing and transportation. Mm. Um, so we basically imported a small town and we really just tried to absorb that. But um, a lot of our employers in North Dakota are leaning towards Ukrainians and um, different, different sectors, healthcare, education, oil field, farming are big sectors that are, and manufacturing are now working in this area, which again, policy needs to be adjusted. Uh, on those because we've got um, South Africans and South Americans that would even move here permanently if we could provide that mechanism for them. But in the farm side there, I think they can only be here nine months, have to go home and come back. Um, so the, can you say what you think the policy should be changed to? I think there has to be a more ready system to support citizenship. Yeah. Or, do have or a, stays to multiple years yeah. because it's very expensive to send people home, bring them back, send people home, bring them back. Um, yeah. When If they have an interest in staying and we are not able to fill these jobs here without them, that there is some yeah. mechanism to support mm -hmm. that. We do have a small section in there about that, but I agree that that should be kind of highlighted more. I know we're struggling here. We, I, volunteer for a group that supports asylum seekers and the work visas take so long and, and these people are begging and to work and expensive they're, they're like yeah and yeah. and a lot of attorneys have said kind of mm -hmm. unofficially like yeah they just work illegally all my clients work illegally but our particular organization you know we try to encourage volunteering or other things that are legal for them to do, but they're begging to work. And it's just a terrible situation that they have to be here sometimes years without being able to have that fulfilling um, and necessary part of their existence. Um, so I know that that's also something that would be grouped in there is the length I of time. Also <laughs> having like, I think some of them have brought their spouses or significant others and they are forbidden from working. So, mm -hmm. so there's yeah. another warm body that could be engaged in the community. That's not. Yeah. Yeah. So Don, with philanthropy, because I've I've asked myself this question and others too, and I haven't really found an answer. Is there a role for government within that? Like if we were recommending something, what would we recommend? I feel like the government has to to help do things that are not being done, right? So mm. even if it's to help get it launched, um, and to help people be trained or to understand, because it's not that we don't have wealth in this area. 
but we just really haven't had the mechanism to access it. Or even so in our suggesting... larger communities where they do have this areas of expertise, regionalizing that expertise or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, are you thinking like public private partnership? Way. So, yeah, yeah, uh, probably like on a rural level, right? You see that in large urban projects as well. So how can we kind of take those great ideas and, and make them our size? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Well, and one other notable thing about North Dakota is there probably are only three or four um, foundations that operate in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. And some of them are, you know, Fargo exclusive or, you know, so there's two or three that, you know, we could go to um, for largely less than $100,000. And wow. so there's, there's not a lot of philanthropic investment. And so even just promoting that, and I don't know, we've been talking about that, you know, what's a good way to try and tap into, because there is wealth, um, you know, I was looking at land um, ownership um, as I was looking for places to build housing. And um, I found I found that there are um, sections of land that are owned by churches. Hmm. And that is how the philanthropy happens. You know, a farmer, you know, donates the section of land to the church and everything that is produced on that land goes to support the church. And um, that kind of stuff is happening. Um, so, you know, I don't know. It's just really interesting. It's very, very conservative up here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is interesting. So Katie, John, um, any others want to jump in and talk about what themes popped to the top for them? Yeah, I could talk a little bit about the sticky note I put up. Um, I mentioned supporting and developing the workforce. Um, maybe that just hits a little close to home for me since we're in economic development and um, at least in the 14 county region that we work in, um, what we're seeing is uh, it's been coined the silver tsunami, which is folks that own businesses who are now thinking about retiring, but a lot of these small businesses, you know, less than five employees, they are the backbone of our, our local economy. Um, but what we're finding is the issue is that people, they're not lining up to buy these businesses or want to take them over. Mm. Um, so there's this really big gap, um, a multifaceted gap of why are people not interested in buying these businesses? And I think it, a lot of it has to do with just a willing workforce in the area, um, which a lot of these points are in the white paper. If you don't have healthcare, if you don't have great education, yeah, um, all these in, in childcare, uh, especially these pieces of infrastructure are not in place, well, um, the city is a bit more enticing. So yeah. that's part of the supply of willing business, future business owners. Another one would be capital, just mm. uh, as a millennial. Uh, we, we had to pay a bit more for education and things mm -hmm. are a bit more expensive for us. So we don't necessarily have uh, the the capital to, to buy a business. Um, mm -hmm. and so that's something that we're really working on is figuring out different alternative tools to make sure that these small businesses that do uh, compose the fabric of our rural areas to make sure that in 20 years, they're still around. Because um, yes, we're kind of facing yeah. a cliff with that. If these businesses close, um, it's just yeah. going to accelerate the issues that we're seeing of, of folks moving away, um, young, young people not wanting to stay because if you don't have the restaurant, if you don't have whatever entertainment um, that that Bill, who's 65 year old, 65 year old and, and is currently managing, but wants to sell that closes, um, we're just going to see this precipitous effect. Mm. Um, so in my mind, that kind of wraps all into developing and supporting the workforce, making sure people have the resources they need, but also what different systems of capital are um, around that beyond banks, um, what what can mm -hmm. we do to make sure that folks who who do have the ambition and know how to take over business, how do we make sure that they can do so? Yeah. I, and, oh, go ahead, please. No, until finish your thought, Juliana, please. Oh, I was just going to say, um, 
at the Center for Entrepreneurship where I work, we have some programming developing for business transitions because it is oftentimes the case that as you know the the silver tsunami happens, um, a lot of folks at that point are just tired and they want to be done. And that's what we keep hearing. Nope, we're done. We and so if there's existing programming that they can just plug into to assist with a transition, um, then that can incentivize them to do that because again, you don't want to lose all of that goodwill and you know what's been built up in the community. Um, and so a lot of the ways that we approach those sorts of things are from like the grassroots way, but I'm super interested if there's, you know, policy recommendations or, you know, funding recommendations that might support um, that work too. Go ahead, Christina. I was just going to say, I wasn't sure if everyone was aware about this program, the Small Business Credit Initiative. I don't know if you know that, but I think every single state got funded. It was $400 million in Texas. And I've been hammering the governor's office who's managing the program, which is federal dollars that were issued by the treasury. But what it is, is basically a lending safety net for banks to lend to small businesses uh, with owners being low to moderate income. I don't know at the second if it was rural, but I'll go back and ask if there was a portion of that or incentive for rural banks or rural businesses. Um, and, and I'm trying to investigate that really, obviously for our clientele of the center, I mean, our entrepreneur group, but the point of the matter is, it's not dollars going to, you know, directly to the end user or the business. It's going as a safety net to lenders to encourage them to do this. There's both a capital aspect to it, capital equipment aspect, and a loan guarantee program. So in Texas, just FYI, we're, it's officially going to be kicked off in January because right now they're taking applications from banks in Texas who want to be part of this program. So I'm telling my entrepreneurs or anybody who's looking for money, is your lender a part of this program? Because that's one way to get access to those who have other challenges that we've been talking about on this call to see if they can get funding for their small business. Anyway, and that's why I just want to say one more thing on that. Yeah. I had a conversation with with Treasury, a person looking for vendor vendors to support um, you know, small businesses. And one of the Treasury, Department of Treasury's initiative is economic resiliency. So this person said, we are looking for people and companies that can focus on economic resiliency, whatever those are. And so that stood out to me in their strategic plan. If you ever just Google strategic plan, Department of the Treasury, it'll tell you their 2022 to 2026 uh, uh, goals and stuff. Um, and she pointed me directly to it. So to answer the mail on this, I think if our communities looked and said, hey, we need this funding, because I think we're all looking at the federal aspect of it too, you know, maybe there's some answers there to, hey, how do we support what the agencies are claiming their initiatives are? Um, I don't know, that just dawned on me. I, I was there in Washington a couple of weeks ago and I was like, mm. um, wait a second, right? And so I was, wanted to figure out more about that. But since they pointed us to these initiatives for through now through 2026, I thought maybe there might be something there that we could um, yeah. latch onto for this program. Yeah, definitely. Please let us know what you find out. You know, and it strikes me too, because I'm also, I see one of the sticky notes is simplification. And I don't know about you all, but for those of you who didn't see um, Tony Pippa's keynote this year at Radically Rural, we do have the recording, um, all the recordings for the sessions this year are on our YouTube channel. But with his Reimagine Rural Initiative, he has this chart that shows all the federal programs and all the federal funding opportunities and how they do or don't work together. And it's this crazy spaghetti sort of thing. And it's like how, you know, there's, there's opportunities out there, but they either don't really work for rural communities or they're difficult to access. And some aren't, some are, you know, but to me, it's like, when thinking of solutions to some of these issues, it makes me a little, it makes my head spin a little bit to think about just adding more programs or more this or more that. So I think part of the solution is to simplify what exists, streamline it, um, support capacity to access and implement it. And in some ways, something really simple that the government could do that would not be a lot it, it would be money, but it wouldn't be a lot of burden on the government 
is just to directly support personnel in rural communities that are already there and already doing the work. We all know that we're living here or working or recreating here. We, we know the needs that exist. We're on the ground doing the work. We just need support to, to be able to continue to do the work that we're doing. Not necessarily someone come in, you know, swoop in with a grand solution, but we just need, I mean, maybe that's like something simple and I don't know how that would work, whether it would be um, sort of like direct operations funding that was multi-year so you could depend on it. You know, I don't know exactly what that would look like, but that's something that comes to mind too in regards to simplifying. All right, what other, we're at 3.22, so we have eight more minutes. Um, we could potentially try to group some of these together, Lily, if we wanna try to group some of these um, by theme. Um, so definitely funding stands out and there would be kind of a waterfall of, of points under funding. <clears throat> Community well-being was another great one. I think about community well-being and that might also tie to systems. Like we've talked about, you know, housing, childcare, um, workforce, all these sorts of systems that really go into the well-being of a community. Um, would there be another word other than framework systems well-being, does anyone have any words for what that could encompass? A topic that hasn't come up yet either that's kind of in this vein is the first responders in small towns are often volunteers and many mm. of them are um, getting older. Yes. And the population base has continued to decline. So yeah, literally like <laughs> at risk. For health and safety um, because of that. Definitely. And something that John said about workforce too, and something else that comes to mind that we talked about during the summit this year and continue to talk about are that the trades are sort of dying out and there's not a lot of apprenticeship or mentorship going on to pass that along. And that is something we need to address um, before it's it's too late and we have to start from scratch when we shouldn't have to do that, so. Okay. All right, and then- Did those spot all under quality of life? Yeah, the well-being yeah. and the systems. Yes, and... quality of life is a great way to put it. Because yeah. I always talk about how great our quality of life is um, cause it really is. Yes. We love, we love the places we live in. Exactly. And yeah. Most of us are rural by choice. Um, yeah. And quality of life is a great way to put it because it's both the opportunity and the benefit and also, um, something that needs attention in rural too. And then it looks like regulations, might be another one. And that one comes up a lot on a on local, state, and federal level as well. Okay. I mean, something you said you about like the systems piece of it is making me think about um, how are we, not just like funding communities, but how are we um, working with communities to identify like what are the systems issues? I think in a lot of rural places, it's, you mm -hmm. know, we, we call out these individual issues like childcare, housing, mm -hmm. you know, quality of life, whatever it may be, but not every community is really connecting the dot to sort of bigger systemic challenges or systemic opportunities even. Um, and how do we, how do we work with communities to recognize some of those underlying rooted causes you know i think a lot of the things we talk about with um workforce or talent attraction and retention uh speaking as someone you know uh yeah in a small community i think a lot of it comes down to what is it that that should attract and retain people in our communities and mm -hmm. you know especially if we're looking at like issues of diversity or uh, you know, immigration and, and you know, asylum seekers in the workforce, things like that. I mean, I think there are a lot of systemic 
challenges and realities actually coming from the community level up that yeah. have to be understood and addressed for us to really, you know, to, to make progress on some of those issues. It, it, it can't like even like volunteer firefighters and EMS, like a lot of that is very much related to uh, aging, aging communities, brain drain, um, mm -hmm. you know, generational connections, you know, understanding sort of obligations to your community, civic engagement, right? Um, and those are all things that we need like a space and communities to have greater dialogue and understanding mm -hmm. about some of these issues if we really want to address them. Not going to just be the, the federal government sort of responding and giving us something. I think a lot of it has to be understood from within as well. Absolutely. And Lillian, you can um, stop share for the moment since we're wrapping up, but I completely agree with you. And that's one of the reasons that, um, you know, Radically Rural wanted to jump into policy a little bit this year, because we do spend most of our time in that kind of community led grassroots work, which is absolutely essential. And so we're trying to figure out how to connect those and how we can lend our voice to to policy. I have my personal feelings about what I think are kind of the the main framework issues of everything, which I feel like is connection with land and connection with each other. I think those two things are kind of the, the foundation of everything. And I spoke with uh, someone from a really cool project called Weave, and it's all about the social fabric of the country. Um, if you've heard of Robert Putnam, he wrote Bowling Alone and Upswing. He has been talking about the decline in the social fabric of America and the opportunities that we have to, um, if you think about a pendulum, kind of swing back up again. And he actually only lives like 20 minutes from us, which is wild, but he, he met with the Weave guy recently and he has a new documentary coming out. Um, and so I was considering either showing, and there's other documentaries that address this as well, showing that at the summit and then having a discussion this year or having a series of documentaries that we kind of like watch in our own time and then talk about leading up to it. But I really do feel that the social fabric component of all of this connection with land, connection with each other, it's so simple, but it really does impact just about everything um, in in life and kind of helps to, for example, um, increase engagement with which might retain folks more and get them more interested in volunteering or interested in engaging with their community, cross-generation, cross-cultural, all of that. So definitely something to consider. And I think all of you have incredible experience to contribute to this. So what I would say next, since we're at time, is please continue to contribute to this document. I will probably put pause on any more of my con contributions for I'd say at least a week to let everyone kind of go in there, do what they need to do for a week. And then I'll go in there and do some, some grouping and rearranging and then continue to write. I won't close it from editing, but that's about when I'll jump back in. And we will likely at that point, send it out to all attendees from the past summit so once it's in a little bit more finessed state, we can send it out to, to everyone and just say like, what are we missing? Because we have really specific experience um, and so do the other folks. And then um, toward the end of the year, it'll be ready to go and, and we'll send it out. But thank you all so much for contributing so much of your time. I know you're all very busy. Thank you for your thoughts and sharing your experiences and any questions or comments before we leave. Yes, we will send out the recording. We post it on our website and also um, send it out as well. So Thanks. for everyone who registered. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.